Just let's go right there. So, okay. um, let me see. Let you know. Let's just pull up the five thirty eight. I'm disappointed standings. we didn't start this show like a week before the season started because yeah. we would already have a full highlight reel of Matt talking about the Jazz. But we started a couple weeks into the season. I've received all that highlight reel, but and it's all stuck in my head. Uh, Matt, what is like? How did this like come about for you? This uh, um, desire to wager on the Jazz so much. Well, yeah, I guess there's an alternate universe where, you know, I've got Kelly Olenek behind me or Lori Markin in Jersey with all this other collection. of The reason that it's these three no, things. next year. No, no, no. At the end of this season, after all your bets sure. are paid off, you're going to add a Lori Markin in Jersey. The I know. Time. It's just the reason it's these three things are these are the three ones I talked about publicly. The Isaiah Stewart thing, the Ben Intendi props, the Celtics last year. I don't have it for the Jazz. But, yes, I can throw, I can throw Jazz stuff up there anyway. For sure. I, I, if they make the playoffs, yeah. Um, but before the season, on 538, the Utah Jazz were projected for 38 wins. And their over-under was 23 and a half. So that is the starting point. Like, I sort of trust these standings projections. Um, there are two things. Well, there's one major thing they don't account for. And it's the changing of the roster during the season. And the, that's such a hard... How do you even build that into a model of prediction, right? It's like a really impossible... <coughs> yeah, you you have to build in uncertainty of how many games Mike Conley will be on the team. Um, what they do have is if a player is hurt, like part of the season is estimated with that player in and part... They could... I guess they could theoretically do that too. But um, the good thing is there is a tool on 538 now where you can adjust the team's rotation yourself and see a new standings projection. So I was very skeptical. Like the Hornets were projected well. Um, the Pacers were like the, the Hornets were projected to be a playoff team on 538. The Pacers were projected like a border. Maybe that one is actually looking pretty decent. Um, and then like the Nets were projected playoff bubble. The Blazers were projected playoff bubble. Um, I still think that's true. The Lakers were projected to be terrible. And that one is an easier sell to me because it worked so well last year. They have basically the same team. But Utah was projected like high 30s and wins. And I know everyone expects them to tank. So what I did was I went into their manual adjustment and I took Mike Conley, um, Jordan Clarkson, Rudy Gay, and Kelly Olenek off the team. I just took them off. I, made, I projected them all for zero minutes and I filled it in with like the rest of the players. And even with that estimate... Utah was at 29 wins. So Damn. with those guys playing none of the season, yep. that was the estimate. They were still at 29 and the over under is 23 and a half. And that like, that's their floor. At that point I was like 29 wins is their floor. Like that's the situation where they just trade everybody before opening night. And so, they, I mean, they could trade for draft picks, but sometimes they get players back, right? Like, yeah. You know, like even if it's a bad player, like Russell Westbrook, right? Like, He's going to go out and try to win games, even if the team's not trying to, right? Maybe to maybe to the detriment of the team, but I, point right. taken. Like the, you're not when they traded away Gobert and Mitchell, they got good players. Like they, yeah, they got guys who actually can play. Um, it was very weird. Like to me, this entire thing was just that everyone basically tagged the Jazz with like a sticker that said, "This is a tanking team." Well, let's not and forget, it, we have to bring up the fact that this is the year to tank, too, right? So, sure. Uh, Mike G pointed out pretty early in the season to me that there's this guy, he's this Frenchman, he's like whatever, 18, 19 years old right now, he's seven foot four, and he looks like Kevin Durant. He's like shooting 30 foot threes, and he's, he just looks like a, a unicorn amongst these, you know, horses. So, if there's yeah. ever a year to tank, it's literally this year. He's a generational talent so far. Yeah, but I guess the problem is we have a lottery system and you don't necessarily get the guy. Um, and I think the teams know that. Like, you can't... So there, there's some of both there. But for sure, it definitely made sense to assume tanking would be more of a priority this year than a different year. Totally agree. Um, but nonetheless, like, the Jazz didn't have the roster or even the possibility of a roster that could lose 60-plus games this year. Like, it just... they they would have had to have essentially their nine best players all not play for them to be like a 20 win team. Absolutely. No, you, you were clearly ahead of the market here. So they, they started off pretty hot. 
Um, yeah, what I didn't know is that they would be 10 and 6 or that they right. would have started 10 and 3. That is totally just, I did not even remotely predict that. You know, you know who else didn't know they were going to be 10 and 6? Danny Age. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's like, he actually, he's, he, like when they, they, when they were like 9 and 3 or 10 and 3, they were asking about it. He says, I'm not sure this is sustainable. I think he was as surprised as everybody. That roster that they had, yes, they got good players. They got good players that are perfect for trading. You look at that roster, those are all guys that like contending teams would like to add as a piece. Olenek is a nice big who can shoot threes and stretch the floor to, to add as a piece if you need to, to to fill in another big guy. Conley can play point guard for anybody. Like just go down a list. Clarkson's the heat check guy. So I, I think Ames was surprised as well. You're right, Matt. This the roster can't couldn't lose sixty or you know, couldn't win be a twenty win team as constructed, but I think Ames thought they were going to get off to a better, uh, a bad start, and then potentially start moving some pieces. Now, I, in some ways, he's stuck because the yeah. team's quote too good. But that's what you got it at what twenty three and a half at the start. Yeah, well, I'll I'll expand on that because yeah, okay. before the season, the bets I made were over twenty three and a half to make the play. Then the bet was for them to make the play in at like plus twelve fifty, and for them to make mm-hmm. the playoffs at like twenty five to one. Um, I did not bet a lot on any of those though, because my assumption was if the jazz start like Owen four, they will very, very quickly start to look at trading options. What I wanted to do was, and I know this because futures odds, just as I followed them over the last couple of years, don't catch up to results as quickly as they should. If they did start well, they might look at the team and be like, we're, we're not bad enough to just give away Jordan Clarkson. Um, Mm -hmm. Point taken, like, they basically have guys that would be the third or fourth best player. I mean, Lori Markinen ended up, it looks like he's actually better than that. But for the most part, it's a team of guys who are, like, number three, number four options, who are, like, your last piece to a championship-winning starting lineup. But um, the idea was, let's see how they do off, like, right off the bat, and then make the futures bets accordingly. If the Jazz had started 0-4... I would have very little on the Jazz on any of their futures. Um, they beat Denver opening night, and I bet, like, a bit more. And then they beat Minnesota, and at that point, they were 250-1 to to win the division when they were 2-0, and just having beaten the top two teams in their own division. Um, and they were projected for, like, 41 wins at that point. So, like, that was the point where it was like, all right, let's, let's start, like, actually looking at these. And then they went into New Orleans and won again. And now they're 3-0 and against, like, three of the top teams in the West. And at that point, that was when I went, like, all right, th- this needs to be, like, a big investment because the the preseason odds were essentially still the odds at that point. That was, the, that was the mistake. It wasn't like, yes, the preseason numbers were really bad, but the fact that they didn't adjust after the 3-0 and start when it was, like, that kind of – we all knew it was that kind of situation, like – the way they played at the very beginning was going to heavily dictate the trajectory of the season in terms of keeping players. And so it was that plus the fact that like Markinen was playing so well, it's like, Oh, this might be a different guy than what he used to be. And Walker Kessler might actually be good. And like Jordan Clarkson actually knows how to pass now. And the coach might be amazing. Like none of that was in the model. Um, so all of 